November 1982, fear cloaks the serenity of a small town in New Jersey. Popular teenager Amy Hoffman has disappeared without a trace. The police can't say if she's alive or dead, but psychic Nancy Weber knows there's been a murder and fears the killer is on a rampage. He's killed before, he's killing again. He's going to kill more. She tells me something, I believe it to be gossip. Can Nancy help catch the killer before his brutality is unleashed again? Three people out for a pleasant afternoon stroll, or so it seems, a closer look and it becomes apparent this is not a recreational time filler. These people are not so ordinary. The conversation underscores the seriousness of their purpose. She's screaming for her life and begging mercy. Right when she was first found, there was no evidence that would indicate a Bill Hughes is a police officer, Nancy Weber is a professional psychic, and because Jimmy Moore not. is retired. He was detective captain at the Parsippany Police Department. More than 20 years ago, the trio came together and stood in this secluded location. What happened here would change their lives forever. November 23, 1982. Amy Hoffman, an 18-year-old senior high school student, leaves her part-time job at a Morris County shopping mall. In the parking lot, she says goodnight to her friend. It's approximately 9.35 p.m. Two people see Amy as she walks across the back lot to where her car is parked. One, a fellow worker driving out of the parking lot. The other, her killer. Well, her vehicle was found in the parking lot, uh, not too far away from the store that she worked in. And the door was open on the car, and, and there was a witness. And she noticed a uh, male, white male, uh, in a green Chevrolet that was parked a couple spots away from where Amy's car was. And he was just sitting there in the, in the car at that time. It's Thanksgiving, two days since Amy Hoffman was last seen alive. Morris County, New Jersey, comprises several small townships. Police departments from across the region become involved in the search for Amy. It had a major impact on the community. Women were, were hesitant about going out on their own, especially at night. 20 miles away in Mount Olive, Nancy Weber, who runs her own psychic practice, gets a phone call from a woman. She said, my daughter has a best friend who works at the Morris County Mall, and she's missing. She didn't come home. And that's when the vision popped up. The image I kept having was this naked body, multiple wounds all over. She was lying in water, raped. She had been terribly, terribly uh, violated before she was murdered. And so I just went right into saying to her, I am sorry. I really can't discuss this with you. You call Amy's parents, or you call the police that are involved. That same day, Amy Hoffman's body was found in a retention tank at the reservoir in Randolph. There was a couple walking their dog through the woods, and it's, it's an isolated area. It's like a lover's lane area. And they came across the body floating in the water. There was numerous slashes and stab wounds to her body and some were post-mortem meaning that after she had died the assailant still continued to slash her and, and cut her body uh, it was pretty gruesome nancy's vision of the dead young woman was accurate bill hughes a detective with the mount olive police department happened to drop by nancy's house most of the police officers in uh, Mount Olive Township knew Nancy because she was just a friend of a lot of guys on the force, her and her family. 
And I stopped by, uh, just stopped by Nancy's house, um, just for a, a cup of coffee. By the way, I read the newspaper account of Amy Hoffman. Why are they lying? She was raped. She wasn't not sexually abused. She was mutilated. Not no wounds obvious. The investigators at the time did not believe that sexual assault had, had occurred, uh, but Nancy said that it had, that uh, the girl had been sexually assaulted. Uh, there was no way of knowing because there was no physical evidence that you could see at the scene, according to the investigators, to indicate any type of sexual contact. Uh, what we found out later on was, yes, she indeed had been sexually assaulted uh, by the suspect, uh, and that was a result of forensics taken by the medical examiner's office. I didn't say anything to Bill about wanting to be involved at all. I, it's one of the things I don't ever do. I wait to be asked. When it comes to this kind of work, it's very important, I believe, for all concerned, including the victim, to know that I am the appropriate person to participate. It's an ingredient. I'm one of the ingredients or not. So I don't ask to help. Maybe to a lesser extent today, but at that time, psychics were certainly not taken seriously. They probably were looked at as people trying to make a name for themselves, people that would take advantage of um, the weak. I was a small player in this investigation. I'm, I'm on the periphery, so I really had no authority. I had to find somebody that was very open-minded, kind of like myself. You know, I, I'll try anything once. I, you know, believe anything once until it's proven wrong. Detective Bill Hughes has faith in Nancy's psychic powers, and she has a real concern that the killer will strike again. He's killed before, he's killing again, he's going to kill more. November 1982, Morris County, New Jersey. 18-year-old student Amy Hoffman goes missing. Two days later, her mutilated body is discovered in a water retention tank. Police from all across the region are hunting down a brutal killer. On the same day Amy's body is discovered, psychic Nancy Weber has a vision of the crime scene. She knows that the young woman has been sexually assaulted and murdered even before police. Now she suspects the killer will strike again. She's right. The second victim was a girl named Deidre O'Brien who worked in a local restaurant and was heading home early in the morning. It was after midnight. She was forced off the road and abducted from her vehicle and later brought to a rest stop on Route 80 in Warren Township where she was murdered. We were all very upset because now we had two gruesome homicides on our hands and we had a feeling that the same individual was involved because the same type of vehicle was seen leaving the scene of Deidre O'Brien's uh, homicide. A second woman dead in such a short time leaves little doubt that police are dealing with a serial killer. But this time, the killer leaves a calling card, tire prints. Detective Bill Hughes thinks it's crucial to get Nancy officially involved in the case. But he is just one of hundreds of police officers tracking down what they now suspect is a serial killer. He needs to get someone he can trust to hear her out. I knew that Jimmy Moore is a seasoned veteran. Jimmy has well over 20 years on the police force at the time. He's a captain. He's in charge of the detectives in Persephone. He's more directly involved in the case because Amy Hoffman is from Persephone. So I knew that if I could talk to Jim, then I might be able to get them to use Nancy uh, to, to do some investigative leads on the case or to give us some direction to go on the case. I had never used a psychic, and I was a little skeptical. I really didn't believe too, too much into them. Is it possible? I mean, can somebody truly do this? Uh, it, it, I actually had flashbacks of being on a boardwalk and down at the Jersey Shore, and you see these signs, palm readings, and, and of course, I don't believe in any of that. So I was a little skeptical, but I said, you know what? We have nothing really to go with. Uh, if, it's, if there's a chance that it's going to solve the case, I'm willing to try it. When I opened the door to Bill at six foot five, standing next to this about five foot seven man who he introduces as Captain Jimmy Moore from Homicide, I thought, uh oh, <laughs> what now? 
And he simply asked me to repeat to Jimmy what I had told him about the newspaper account of Amy Hoffman and my belief that there was a discrepancy there. I asked Nancy some questions and stuff like that and pretty much got wanted to get to know her as an individual. And I found out that she was a just down-to-earth type of individual. And uh, she didn't seem to be a person that exaggerates or puts anything on. She, and I was impressed uh, by her personality. And I said, how do you do this? And she just, I, I just see it. And she says, I don't know why or how, but I, I just see things. And she says, all I can do is tell you what I see. And she says, I don't want you to tell me anything about the case, and I want you to give me any leads. What we decided to do at that point was take a ride in my car. And what we were going to do is uh, take her, Nancy, by the, uh, the scenes, uh, the scenes of the abduction uh, and the scenes of the murder and the scenes where their bodies were left. When I was driving with Bill and Jimmy in the car the first day, when we went down a, a road, I could feel I was coming towards the end of her life. It was as if the energy of the road itself got darker and darker, got more magnetically charged with an energy that felt more panicky, heightened anxiety. The first place that we went to was the reservoir in Randolph. Uh, we took Nancy down there and parked the cars and we let Nancy walk around. It was an eerie feeling, you know, it was a very isolated area, wooded area, no homes around. Um, very macabre. You could almost feel uh, the horror that Amy would have gone through. Amy could have been dumped in any one of about 12 acres. And Nancy went right to the spot where Amy was left. I felt almost as if Amy was waiting for me there on the ground. So I got down on the ground on my knees and I could feel no separation between the memory of what Amy went through and myself at that point. I began to speak words I believed were the last words where she was begging, please don't kill me. I believe she knew that that's what he was about by then. She had already been raped. She had already been badly cut. And I believe she understood that he was enjoying this. And she didn't know how to get through to him. She had no idea how to get through to this person who seemed bent on destroying her. For me, it was very important to stay with it because I'm looking for the tiniest bit uh, of a clue, a shred of evidence that might stop him. Went back in the car and kept reviewing. Now I'm going over all the film. Again and again, like an editor, attempting to be as detailed as possible. Pop. He's from Polish descent. He grew up in Morristown. Pop. He was in Florida. He was in jail there for murder. And I'm telling Jimmy and Bill as I get it in the car, driving. They let him out. Early parole? Pop, his name kept coming to me, the man who was with her, James. I don't know if she knew his name. I knew I knew it. So when I got the last name beginning with a K and Kadababaich. I felt that Nancy was seeing what we were looking for. She had this individual pegged and she was trying as hard as she could to give us as much evidence that we, that she could see, to to, uh, to to arrest us, to arrest him. Because she kept telling me, Jim says this guy is sick, and he's just going to keep killing until he's caught. And she was upset with that. She she was very adamant about telling me that this was a sick individual and he's just going to keep on killing. It wasn't a crime of passion. It wasn't he stalked this particular person for weeks and had an obsession with her. He had an obsession with joy 
at causing harm. When I saw that, I knew he's not going to stop until somebody stops him. This man will not stop. With two brutal murders occurring within 10 days, every available police officer in Morris County is on the case. Most are following procedure, the routine that is police work. Two are following a totally different line of inquiry. Detectives Jimmy Moore and Bill Hughes have teamed up with psychic Nancy Weber in their own private investigation. They've been able to get quite a bit of information from Nancy about the first murder. Now they want to know what she can tell them about the second. After the Deidre O'Brien homicide, I picked up Nancy and we, we drove to the rest area where the crime had taken place. She took us right to the spot where the, where the suspect had parked uh, with Deidre. Uh, she described the encounter there. And I see this truck in my mind. And I see a trucker and I see this woman uh, coming out of a speeding car. She's naked. She's knifed. And I'm looking at the car, and I'm looking at It's the same car. It's James. I know it. The only thing that stopped him from continuing with his attempt to sexually assault her was the fact that there was a truck parked in the rest area a little ahead of them. Nancy felt that the assailant had just had enough and didn't want to be bothered with her anymore, so he stabbed her and threw her out of the car and then drove her off. And that's when Deidre was, had enough strength to pick herself up and, and go to the truck to uh, knock on the door of the, getting help from the truck driver. The truck driver got on the CB radio and radioed for help, and troopers eventually got there, but uh, uh, unfortunately, Deidre passed away in the arms of the truck driver. I was impressed with Nancy when I took her to the truck stop because everything that she was telling me was exactly what had happened as much as we knew from the evidence and from the truck driver's uh, statement. She's telling us stuff that there's no way Nancy could have known because this is, you know, in the investigative files. This is not stuff that's being released to the press. And yet, Nancy knows what happened. Over the next few days, Nancy keeps replaying the visions over in her head. Every time I would go back to James, I would get another tiny little piece. He was at least about 5'10", slim, very narrow, thin, long nose, dark eyes. And I'd spend hours on it. I would be reviewing it, kind of like 18-hour days of review editing. Then I'd go back some more, and I'd feel the car, his brother, gas station. Brother owns it, works it. That's where he got the car from his brother at a gas station. They're local. They're Wharton, they're Morristown, they're local. They all know who he is. Everybody knows who he is. They'll know his last name. He was a local terror, growing up even. The cops all know who he is. He's not an unfamiliar character. This guy was dangerous when he was in high school. Nancy's coming up with all this stuff that she couldn't have possibly known about, and she's given us all this good information. Uh, and then a little bit of frustration sets in because you, you, you believe what she's saying, and now you're trying to think to yourself, how am I going to convince the bosses in Morris County to listen to what she has to say? At this stage, the detectives want permission from the county prosecutor to officially involve Nancy in the investigation. But before they can present their case, they are denied access to his office. The prosecutor is not interested. As Nancy and I started to walk through the door, a detective from the prosecutor's office stopped me, and who knew me personally, and he said, Jim, what's she doing here? I said, well, she's been with us and given us information on the, on the case. And he said, well, the prosecutor doesn't want her here. He doesn't want to get involved with her. I was upset with the prosecutor for not even hearing us out. I felt that he should have at least listened to what we had to say, and it bothered me. It, it, to this day, it bothers me why he did that. The headlines were all over not only our state, but the nation and all, all the news that we had a serial killer. Nobody knew who it was. They couldn't figure it out. Nancy is also upset and frustrated. 
she decides to appeal to a higher authority. She calls some students who she trusts and they form a psychic circle. Together they use psychic prayer to try and stop the killer in his tracks. Went through everything. And when I was finished, I told them, join hands with me. So we went to the light, went to the Godhead, went to the apex, and through that, asked that if it was in the spiritual path of all concerned, to bring back to James K. Papa Itch the pain he has given and the suffering he has caused, let him feel it now. Let him get it in such a manner he can no longer give it. And I simply held on to that thought the rest of the night. It was my mantra, it was my chant. It is his time. Let him feel his own pain, he cannot give it out any longer. Let him feel his own pain, he cannot give it out any longer. It is over. The power of divine intervention has been argued and disputed since time began. Can a New Jersey psychic's prayer really stop the killer in his tracks? In fact, there's been a dramatic break in the case overnight. I get a call home and I was told that an individual was arrested uh, in response to the Amy Hoffman, Deidre O'Brien murders. They responded to a home in Morristown where an individual had been stabbed. While they were at the scene, one of the officers noticed the green Chevrolet sitting in the driveway, and it matched the description of the vehicle we were looking for. So they called for the forensic team to come to the uh, scene to uh, check this vehicle out. As it turned out, they, they found the tire on the car matched the imprint that was found at uh, Deidre O'Brien's abduction. And subsequently, the individual was arrested, charged with the two homicides. When I found out, who the individual was and his background, I couldn't believe how accurate Nancy's information was that she had given us. So we have our guy under arrest, James Kodadich, um, and what we find out about James is very interesting. A lot of the stuff that Nancy had told us was right on the money. James Kodadich had a brother who was a mechanic, had lived pretty much his entire life in, in Morris County. James had moved to Florida, had been in prison in Florida, and that he'd murdered while he was in prison in Florida, stuff that Nancy had come up with. His last name was Kodadich, the K and the I-T-C-H that Nancy had come up with. Early in the morning, I get a call from Jimmy, and he goes, hey, Nancy, what did you do? I said, what do you mean, what did I do? He said, what did you do? I said, I had class last night, and I told him about it, and he said a prayer finish it. I make this man have all the pain he gave to women. He said, well, James Kadadich, and as he said the words in the name, I was like, boom, 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 lights go on. I went, that's him. All the information that she saw, that she gave us, was exactly the truth. I think that a lot of people have to see for themselves. You know, there's going to be people that are going to watch this episode and they're going to see me and they're going to listen to me talk, they're going to listen to Jimmy Moore talk, they're going to listen to different people talking about their experiences with psychics, and they're just not going to buy it. And so be it. Um, but if you're a police officer and you don't buy it, then you probably shouldn't be on in the investigative side of anything. I says, because like, like I said before, you've got to keep an open mind. You've got to be willing to try anything. If you try it and you don't like it and it doesn't work out for you, so be it. And don't try it again if you don't want to, but at least try it once. But there is still a mystery surrounding the event of James Kodadich's arrest. Police arrived at his house after he called them complaining he'd been stabbed. Could Nancy's prayer have anything to do with this? He claimed that a dark-haired woman ran him off the road and knifed him in the back. And at the time, my hair wasn't gray and it was longish. And I thought, I wonder if he'd recognize me if he met me. I'd love it. I'd love him to know that, you know, you stand there with all the victims and that victims have power, you fool. How could you do this? It's up to you to decide whether she had anything to do with it or not. 
On October 29, 1984, James Kodadich became the first man sentenced to die under New Jersey's revised capital punishment statute. The sentence was later commuted to life imprisonment. After his arrest, it was determined that Kodadich had actually stabbed himself. He never explained why, although the self-inflicted wounds were not life-threatening. And apparently, he never again spoke of the long-haired woman he claimed had attacked him. But perhaps he sees her now and then.